mermaids, tuna missiles, fire bees, snow monkeys and more. This episode is jam-packed with several designs. Normally each episode only has around 3-5 to five designs, but since there are so many, I want to try something new out. So if you want to see any specific designs, feel free to check the little timestamps at the bottom, but if you want to see the whole episode and all the explanations for them, feel free to just, I don't know, don't do anything and watch the video. Although this is going to be longer than your average episode, I'm going to try and not take too long on each design, so hopefully it's not going to end up too boring. Or maybe it will anyway, let me know how you feel about it either way. But anyway, howdy folks, and welcome back to another episode of Making a Fakemon Region. The show where I, well, make a fictional area, and then I fill that fictional area with a bunch of fictional monsters based around certain concepts. Now, I'll admit, my uh, last few episodes have been... They're eh, kind of weak. My starters were more based around the story of the monster and not the monster's design itself. And then, well, most of them were relatively simplistic. You know, just rats from around the region, mining birds, skating caterpillars. Now, most of that was because, well, the first designs were already made before I started this series. So th these were made about, a I think, just over a year ago, when I didn't have too much thought into the original designs in the first place. So I just kind of had to shoehorn the evolution ideas, but these ones are all going to be brand new and specifically created with the main concept in mind, JAPAN! Now, I've, I keep saying how this main Fakemon area is meant to be based around all the Earth's cultures and worlds all combining into one area. And other than the odd occasional reference here and there, I've never really tackled a specific location yet. And since we've recently hit 100 subscribers, thank you everyone, I thought it was time to actually do a big special and actually tackle an actual part of the world and make a bunch of monsters inspired by that part of the world. And this part of the world being JAPAN! Since the Olympics were there ages ago, this video was meant to be in time with the Olympics, but you know what's funny about not having internet? Still not having internet. This video would have been postponed much more because I'm currently ill, but no, we're doing this video because I kid you not, I had a 20 subscriber special planned, what then turned into a 40 subscriber special, then a 50, then a 75, and now we're already on 116, so if I don't make a special, I'm never gonna make a special. I also wanna quickly mention the fact that the Rubin video has over a thousand views now. Can you tell me why? I honestly have no idea why. I honestly, is it the designs, is it the idea? If you watched it, please let me know. I'm genuinely curious. Maybe I can take the bits of people like and implement it in the new videos, so everyone wins. And before we jump into the Fakemon designs, a few quick disclaimers. I don't know how obvious it is, I'm not Japanese, and most of these facts are from my own research, and, well, I have, I've had no one to proofread it, because it's just me who does these. So if I say a fact what seems wrong, or is incorrect, by all means call me out, but be nice, because... I'm a sensitive soul. And if I missed uh, an important part of Japanese culture, what you think could work into a cool Fakemon, keep in mind that I'm not done with Japanese Fakemon after this episode. By all means, I might return to the Japanese thing and make some more, but for now, these are just the ones I've made so far. Right, so on to the Japanese things, part one. Yokai. Yokai, from my understanding, are Japanese folklore monsters. I suppose how in England and America and perhaps other countries, we have the Boogeyman, which is a not real creature, but we tell stories about it regardless. Japan basically has a lot of these called Yokai or Yokai. And in Japan, arguably one of the most famous Yokai is the Kappa. No, not that one. Th 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 this one. Yep, that's a history lesson for you. About 20 years ago, this is what a Kappa was if you told someone. Actually, I don't think they'd know what a Kappa was, unless they were Japanese. Either way, these turtle looking little creatures have weird little dents in their head what they keep water in what is supposedly their power source they're mischievous sometimes evil but well mannered they've got taste they've got standards they're known to drag children and animals off and drown them which is terrifying to think and the way to stop them is to bow in front of them as well since they're so polite they'll have to bow as well empties the water off their head and then the power source is gone so they need to retreat or they become your friend if you give them back the water it's something like that like they're they're like wolves in minecraft how they can be malicious if you attack them first but if you tame them they'll be your friend forever it's something like that so not only are the kappa one of the most popular types of yokai in japanese culture they're also just adorable, so I had to make a mod based around it. A little problem I had whilst trying to draw it was the fact that, well, I feel like I wanted to make it obviously inspired by the Kappa, yet since they are such a, well, they're a mythical creature anyway, 
you could literally just draw one and it would look Pokemon-esque anyway. So I wanted to try and give it some slight attributes to make it stand out and make it obvious that this is a Sidelmon, not just a regular Kappa. So whilst researching the Kappa, I realised a few things about it. Now, although they live around swamps and marshes, I believe, they hate bad smell. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the actual stories of what these Kappa are involved in, but let's just say one of the best ways to defend yourself from them is to fart on them. If you want to find out what those stories are, by all means do your own research, but I'm not telling it on this channel. And I also learned, whilst researching them, is that their arms can be pulled off, and that's a relatively easy way to neutralise them. And considering the fact that it's got like a water bubble on its head, I changed it from a sink kind of to like a bubble. I think that's more just the sprite couldn't realistically make it look like a bowl, so... Either way, since it does carry around a water source with it and it hates bad smell, I like the idea of maybe this kappa is, well, a cleaner. That way it was just kind of a, well you wouldn't expect it if it lives in swamps, but turns out, well, it only lives in clean swamps, and if it's in a dirty swamp, well, it spends most of its day cleaning it. And since it's meant to have, well, arms you can pull off, well, I made his arms not actual, or made out of muscle tissue or bone, they're made out of, like, just pure soap. So that way I can imagine them being pulled off without it them being too, well, gruesome. And then there's the idea of, well, they like to pull pranks on other people. Maybe like they like to rub soap on things to make them slippery and watch people fall over. But then since it's easy to just pull an arm off, well, they'll do chores for you. They'll clean up for you to, well, get their arm back. I also like the idea that their idea of pulling a prank is simply just cleaning something what they wasn't told to do. Like, they're, they're so polite to the point where their type of prank, although they do enjoy making people trip up or slip up or do things like that, they also just enjoy like, well, ha, I'm gonna clean this pot so it's shiny. So you can't have the satisfaction of doing it yourself. Even though, well, in reality, he's doing them a favor. And this kind of ties in, funnily enough, actually. I didn't intend for this to. But Kappas actually love sumo wrestling, somehow. I, I wouldn't have thought that from looking at them, but always full of surprises. And in some Japanese traditions, uh, sumo wrestlers, as a type of trial, I guess you could say, is to wash, well, the previous sumo wrestler sensei, I believe it is. So I'm not sure if it's an actual trial or if it is just, well, they must treat their sensei with such respect, they literally wash them. So someone who likes to clean and is a sumo wrestler, it works out. So I like the idea that perhaps like the young Kappas prefer to clean the older ones, make sure they got a shiny shell. Kappas have shells. They draw a very weird line of, is it more human or is it more turtle? It's very strange. I love them. So yes, this is Kalipa, the fighting poison type. Poison because, well, it has soap arms what it can use as toxins and fighting because it enjoys sumo wrestling. And the name Kleeper comes from, well, Cleaner and Kappa. Kleeper. Right, so moving away from yokai to, well, actual Japanese animals. The national Japanese animal is the Japanese macaque, also known as snow monkeys. These monkeys are incredibly interesting because of how they survive winter. They manage to survive by, well, journeying through all the snow and cold until they find hot springs. They're a great symbol for working hard and having an even better reward. They also like to play with snowballs, which is really cute and the inspiration for its first form. This is also mixed with the idea that Japan likes to put faces on a lot of things, whether it's in folklore or just to make things look cute, they like to put big smiley faces on things. And I don't blame them, it looks amazing. So I kind of like the idea of this being um, the idea that it's a baby monkey just covered in a giant snowball with a giant face. And whilst doing more research about the Japanese macaque, I realised that the famous saying, the three wise monkeys, you know, the whole hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, those three are all actually Japanese macaques as well. So I like the idea of this little guy has, well, three split evolutions based around the three wise monkeys. And furthermore, based around the three elements what will create hot springs, which is the source of their survival during the winter. So water, fire and rock. Now, this might as well be my catchphrase throughout this show, but I'm not that great of an artist. And these three monkey evolutions really did test that. Especially with pixel art, where you're trying to get really fine small details, but you really can't with pixel art. I really did struggle on these three designs. Now, obviously the footage is going to be way sped up. On average, it's around like 2,000, 3,000% sped up. But these three designs alone took collectively the longest I've ever really spent on a Fakemon during this entire series so far. Each of them each took well over an hour and well, I... The average for most mons is normally around 20 to 40 minutes depending on how well, complicated Sprite is. But I'm still happy with the end result and well, a few weeks ago if you asked me to draw a, a relatively realistic proportioned Japanese macaque, I would say I couldn't, can't do that and well, 
I can now, so I've got that at least. Normally I usually show each one off once I finish speed drawing, but I realised since I kind of went on a tangent, I was going to show all four of them at the end of the speed draw anyway. Although it started off as a weird coincidence, I did like the idea that each of the three evolution monkeys their body shape and pose are each based off, well, the Japanese symbol for that element. Now, not perfectly, because, well, some of them have extra lines and squares, but as close as I could realistically make with just, well, a monkey body. So the first macaque evolution, the water and ice type, they are all part ice types now, because, well, they evolved from a snowball, is the monkey who represents the sea no evil. The sea no evil because, well, water's see-through. I like the idea that, well, the reason they have this very specific evolutions is more of a choice rather than a actual limitation they have. This monkey can open its eyes if it wanted to, but it doesn't need to. But anyway, it's got a lot shaggier fur than the other two. What likes to soak up most of the water when it goes in the hot springs, and when it jumps out of the hot springs, well, the water freezes to him. And, well, you know, since it is such fuzzy fur, he gets, like, you know, weird, weird little water bubbles on his fur, or well, freeze into ice bubbles, and he also gets, you know, ice frozen on him. What he likes to throw as shards, as weapons, things like that. Now, I was worried about this design, because obviously there is three other kind of free wise monkey inspired designs and well the Sino monkey is also a water type and i wonder if that was also because water see through but either way no, i definitely used it as well a, a kind of guide point to make sure it wasn't looking not like a monkey i was also worried about making its eyes closed i wanted to give it maybe something specific like maybe there's like an ice bandana frozen over its eyes and that's why they can't see but i realized that would have been a bit too cluttered plus eyes closing is just a really easy way to show that well yeah they can't see even though it is an unanimated sprite but just imagine the fact that he wouldn't normally ever open their eyes. A quick side note, uh, after this, the water and fire monkey are both going to look quite different. I did a fair bit of editing and clean up just to make them more obviously their respective types, because I felt like they looked way too similar afterwards, but yeah, that's the water one. And now we have the Hino monkey, the fire one. Its posing was kind of awkward because I was trying to make it the, well, the Japanese fire symbol. However, well, I didn't really think, I couldn't make its legs bend like the symbol, so I thought I'd make him sat down with his, like, maybe his hands up. But then I realised it looked too similar to the water one, but then I thought it was cute that maybe he looks like he's just yawning, because he's a fire monkey, he spends a lot of time in the warm hot springs, so he, he, he's a lot he's a lot more relaxed and chill, he likes to yawn a lot. All the water what goes into his fur just immediately steams up, so he's always got like a cloud of steam, what he just likes to mellow in. I also like the idea that his face does kind of look a bit like a tiki torch, or I should say a face tiki torch. And even though, well, he can see, he's got his eyes closed in that one sprite, because again, non-animated, so you have, to, you have to take my word for it. And then I like the idea that the reason he's, um, death is just because, well, he's always, he's got fire inside of him, what just lets it, like, smoke and steam out of his ears. So he chooses to let the fire rage on inside of him. He doesn't need to hear, so he's fine with letting it out of his ears. And I guess that was inspired by the fact that I feel like most of it was a myth now, but most... We did used to believe that most mammals expelled heat through their ears, and well, this is a fantasy land, so I can make that a fact. And I made him the hear no monkey because, well, fire can be loud, so you can't hear others through fire. And then moving on to the rock monkey, the speak no evil. After realising how similar the first two looked in design, I wanted to make this one a lot more, I guess, obviously inspired by a macaque, as I realised the first two colours that... that Macaques do have brownie fur, but they also tend to have a lot lighter fur as well, and I wanted the rock one to embody that. And well, after I edited them both, neither of them have brown fur. Anyway, so this is the only macaque who actually has the closest colour to an actual macaque. I made him the speak no monkey because, well, rocks don't speak. There's a saying that if someone is ignoring you, or well, just ignoring your points, what you're making in a conversation, you say, well, it's like I'm talking to a brick wall, because, well, a brick wall wouldn't be able to hear you either. Which you might think, well, why not make him hear no monkey, but, well, bricks can't speak either, so it makes sense. I also gave him a lot more stocky design and fluffier cheeks like an actual macaque. I do like his design a lot, and then I just stuck rocks on him. Not to make it obvious that he's a rock type, but also just the fact that, well, the fire monkey has steam and smoke around, and the water monkey has water bubbles on them. The rock monkey has, well... I like to think that, you know, he collects dirt on his fur just to create, um, you know, heat in his body to protect him from the cold and then, well, some of them just turn into rocks. Or, well, they sharpen up into stone things. But either way, that's all the three wise monkeys and the baby snowball. The baby snowball being called Snaru, which is a mix of snow and Saru, which is Japanese for monkey. And then it's three evolutions, See No Zaru, Hear No Zaru, and Speak No Zaru. Obviously from the See No, Hear No, and Speak No, and Zaru, which is Japanese for macaque. Although Sino works a lot better as well, because, well, Sino 
has snow. Snow monkey. And since Japan likes to include monkeys in a lot of folk tales and legends, I like the idea that maybe the legend behind these three evolutions is that, you know, the three wise snowballs climbed the highest mountains to find the hot springs to survive, each one of them being smart enough, you know, to deflect any evil doings. One of them was wise to not see any evil, one never spoke it, and one never heard any evil. To the point that when they finally got to the fabled hot springs, each of them took a very special part of the evolution from the hot spring. Spring. One took an elemental stone, what brought the water, evolving it into the water monkey, a special rock into the rock one, and a fire stone, what heated up the hot springs to be the fire monkey. Just as an old legend like that, what you'd probably in-game find in a library just to add a bit of lore to the place. I don't know, I thought that was cute. Right, so now let's go on to another Japanese animal, or well, insect in this case, the Japanese honeybee. Japanese honeybees are quite extraordinary actually. And well, for one main reason, they have to live with the giant Asian killer hornet things. I'm not gonna show a picture because they are terrifying, but well, they kill any other type of bee, so how does a Japanese bee survive against them? Well, when the bees see one, they essentially order a charge where all the bees make a bee ball, not a basketball, but a ball made out of bees, to cover the giant wasp, and they all flap their wings so quick the friction from it causes a heat ball, and essentially it cooks the wasp alive. Truth is sometimes stranger than fiction indeed. So, although not necessarily a fire bee, it is a bee what has the ability to create a lot of heat when there's a lot of them. So, I'm going to exaggerate that and make a literal fire bee. However, we already have a bee fakimon. I wouldn't blame you for not knowing this guy, he was from my first ever proper fakimon episode. Feel free to watch it if you want, but keep in mind that, well, I wasn't used to doing this whole thing. I'm still not really, but either way. So, Stingbee is a lovely, happy, friendly butterfly bee monster. Well, let's create an in-regional variant. Don't know what an in-regional variant is? Watch this episode where I explain them and show some off. I'm nailing these episode plots. Or if you don't want to, I'll quickly explain it. In regional variant is just like a normal regional variant in Pokemon, except, well, instead of it being in a different region, the both variants are in the same region. And since we haven't done one in a while, the last I did was in the rap video where I introduced the idea. If, if, why not? So the original Sting Beat was a bug and flying type. I knew this guy had to be part fire, but I didn't know what to replace. The bug or flying. It seemed obvious, but I honestly didn't know. I then liked the idea that, well, maybe it takes what the real-life Japanese bee does, literally, where it flaps its wings so quick to combust flames to attack and, like, deter predators. Maybe it just does that all the time, instead of specifically to when it's doing the bee ball thing. Because of this, it's burnt its wings off. It doesn't fly anymore, so it's not a flying type anymore. It's just a bug and fire type. Still collects honey, though. Instead, it just, I guess, waddles around and flapping its wings really quickly to cause embers and dust and everything. I did have a few previous designs where I didn't know whether to make its wings constantly on fire or just having dust on it around and everywhere. But I like the idea that its wings have just burnt off. So I guess since there's a fire bee, now I need to make an Asian hornet fakimon. That's a fun idea. I'm not going to do it now, but I will do it at some point, trust me. But yeah, that's Sting Bee, the fire variant of, well, the regular Sting Bee. On to the next animal. Well, whilst researching some fun fa facts about Japanese culture, it's no secret that, well, sushi is quite popular in Japan. I think it's its national food. And whilst reading some fun facts about it, I realised one of the most expensive fish ever bought just to make it. In Japanese history, there was a tuna, I kid you not, bought for the equivalent of 3.1 million US dollars. I want to say that's more money than I've spent in my entire life so far. And I mean, looking at the picture, it is a big fish, but still, that's a lot of cheddar to be going in sushi. In fact, I don't think cheddar would work well in sushi. Hmm. I'll be right back. No, so whilst doing some research into, well, the tuna, I realised that it was an endangered species, that's a shame, named the blue fin tuna. They are large, they live for a long time, and they're expensive. Whilst reading some facts about the bluefin tuna, I noticed a certain phrase, it is built like a torpedo. So we have our design there, a tuna torpedo with some slight sushi inspirations as well. Although regular tuna aren't as slim as this one, I kind of took more of a torpedo essence of the fact that it swims really quick, so it is just like a water bullet. And whilst drawing it, I did realize that they are literally two fish missile Pokemon as well introduced in Sword and Shield. 
That was a weird coincidence. I only realized what when I was drawing its tail, and I like the idea that the tail would spin, and then I realized that is literally one of the Pokemon in Sword and Shield. I also really like the idea that, well, most bombs, when they explode, they, they drop Strapnel, which is like weird metal flakes left over from the bomb. I like the idea that with the sushi inspiration is that its back scales look very similar to rice, and maybe they also taste like rice, they're very soft. So not necessarily every time he explodes, but like when he's swimming through the air, and maybe when he hits targets, it does shake and drop a lot of little rice pellets. What are very tasty. I also didn't know what to do with the weird beeping nose thing. I did intend for that to be like the kind of a tip of a missile, but then it kind of turned into like a, a police warning thing what just beeps when it's on target. So I don't know what it's really meant to do yet, and I don't think it looks like it suits it. It looks fine without it, but I kind of like it. I feel like that's... I need to integrate a bit better next time, but eh, that's what it is. This is Tushido, a mix between tuna, sushi, and torpedo. I guess you could also pronounce it like Tushido or Torshido, whichever the way you want. And since this was inspired by the most expensive tuna ever, I did want to add a golden variant to this. Not necessarily a shiny, but very similar in concept where all it changes is the colour and it's both extremely rare. I like the idea that in the game there is a market to sell Tushidos based on, you know, the moves it learns, the levels, its happiness, its gender. And well, if you find a golden one and sell it, you can make big, big bucks. We're talking max out per card. I always like the green accents based on, you know, wasabi, which is also common in sushi. And the rice turns a lot whiter because, like, the most expensive sushi is also golden and it looks like it's got more pearls on it, so that's what, that's that reference. Now on to its evolution. It's not an evolution in the sense of the fish just gets bigger, it's more of an evolution in theme. Kind of like how Magikarp doesn't evolve into a bigger fish, it evolves into a giant serpent-like dragon. Now kind of going back into the yokai, Japanese mermaids are called ningyo. And despite how most people believe what mermaids are, where it's a fish bottom, beautiful goddess, top half, ningyo, the mermaids in Japanese culture, are a lot more fish people, not so much just a fish upper half. It's mostly fish with normally a human face and weird uh, semi-aquatic limbs. A lot more mer monster than mermaid. Whilst doing some research about these um, mermaids, I realised that there's a story about a young girl eating a bit of them and, well, when she grew up, she stopped aging at a certain point and she, was, and she lived forever in the worst way possible where everyone she married, everyone she loved, they all died and, well, she lived for around 800 years before she got so sad of life she ended up killing herself. So yeah, a very sad story. So I wasn't sure if I wanted to make the mermaid beautiful but scared to attract others because Again, Tudor lived for very long, this mermaid would have lived for ages, and it didn't want to fall in love because it knows it'll outlive whoever it falls in love with. But at the same time, I still really wanted to keep the idea of this monster mermaid because, well, since there's the golden tuna anyway, it's meant to show that beauty is only skin deep anyway, so I like that concept of it doesn't need to look commercially beautiful to feel like it is. After a while of thinking about it and brainstorming, I just like the idea that perhaps the way for the tuna to evolve into the mermaid is to really wish to be beautiful enough to the point where it gets its wish, but it doesn't realize it at first. Where it first thinks it's ugly and it's not attractive, but it realizes on the inside, it's beautiful. So for it to evolve, it needs to realize its own inner beauty or something like that. So a slight mix of both ideas where, although it isn't literally as beautiful as it originally was going to be, it feels like it is, even though it is still a mermonster. I also threw some more sushi inspiration. I like the idea that it kind of like a, a back shell pillow thing, what looks like salmon sushi. And the, and the uh, seaweed roll kind of turns into a whole dress kind of thing. Her hair looks like wasabi, seaweed. The rice kind of grows all over her body and they're more sharp. And like, you know, she sends it through the water. She sends her own mini missiles instead of being the missile. And most sushis do have very colourful sauces on them, so I gave her kind of colourful, wiggly coral, what, you know, is on her hair. I thought that'd be kind of cute. Along with giving the rice what she grows on her body, inspired by actual colours of rice, like green rice, blue rice, and red rice. She also has two different coloured arms now. This kind of stemmed from the fact that I wanted to make her arms more chopstick-like originally, with the idea of them having pretty designs on them, but as time went on they just turned into more obvious fish hands, but I, I kept the coloration. This one also took a long time to draw, like an hour and a half as well. Hopefully it was worth it, you, you'll have to let me know what you all think of them. So anyway, this is Kushingyo, a mix between Utsu Kushi, which is the Japanese word for beauty, sushi, and Ningyo, the Japanese mermaid. And again, here's the gold variant. I like the idea that although the, when it was a tuna, the gold was a lot more 
shiny and beautiful, but no, it isn't as golden, looks a little bit murky, but it still thinks it looks beautiful, which is the important thing. I was originally going to make it a lot more red, as red is apparently a sign of wealth and power in some scenarios, but it didn't really work. Plus, it's meant to be gold anyway, so I've just made it the salmon colour. I was actually going to make the yellow a lot brighter, but when I, the more I did and fiddled with it, it looked a bit too like human pale, which is not what I wanted at all. Right, so next design. It's no secret that Japan is mostly also known as the grandfather of video games. Where we got the Mazios, the Sandlick Hedgehogs, and the Pakumans. It's no secret that without Japan, the gaming industry would probably be a lot different. And since Japan is also huge on mascots, it literally has a whole subculture about them, I thought it'd be cute to make a video game mascot so, uh, monster thing. A concept where this was created to be a video game character just in real life because it's a fantasy world. However, many people just started using it as battle to the point where it's just started to learn it and over time it now is just a monster what you can collect as well. Kind of like Porygon. Quick side tangent, this, uh, this design is also a little bit personal to me as well because a few years ago I was making a horror game called The Town That Screams. Ooh. And one of the main villains was uh, an arcade animatronic character. Insert Five Minutes of Freddy's Joe's Ha Ha. But I remember spending, spending ages trying to make a pixely robot, but it just didn't work. And I remember giving up on the idea and well, giving it a much more rounder design, which ended up making this character pixel. Include more Five Nights Freddy's Joe's Ha Ha Ha. So this design for me, also making a pixely character, weirdly meant a lot more than what I thought it would be because this is finally um, an actually good orange pixel character, so that's a qu quick little side tangent. That is also why I decided to go with the colour orange. I also like the idea of making an 8-bit because, well, he's an old video game character and giving him the limited colour palette of just two colours and black and white. Originally, I was going to give him a 16-bit evolution as well, but eh, we'll save that for another episode. But either way, this is Pixu Koto, a mix between pixel Pikuseru, which is Japanese for pixel, and Masukoso, which is Japanese for mascot. Although I do like how my pixel character is now, and I still, you know, use him from time to time, I feel like a weird weight has been lifted where I finally did manage to draw an 8-bit alien game character. It's weird. Either way, let's go on to another famous thing what Japanese uh, kickstarted, or well, maybe not kickstarted per se, but created very well and popularised. The Kaiju. Japanese for strange beasts, the kaiju is a genre of monsters what are giant and they normally destroy cities or fight other giant monsters. Need I even tell you the two famous ones of King Kong and Godzilla? I also thought it was interesting the fact that while well, both of their movies kind of both had commentary on different concepts of human behaviour. How Godzilla was supposedly meant to be warning us about uh, atomic testing as well, his creation is supposedly from the result of the atomic bomb. So I also wanted to create a giant evil monster. What was created from, well, to warn humanity of its wrongdoings. Similar to the monkeys, I like the idea of there being an old ancient story of when this creature first risen and terrorised humanity. Until eventually humanity learned its lesson and they stopped doing whatever they did and the monster calmed down. However, it was so long ago, they forgot what exactly made the monster so angry in the first place. So nowadays, these monsters just, you know, they're relatively dormant, although very dangerous still. No one really knows their exact origins and, well, what it does. However, since it is such a popular concept, people have marketed the hell out of this guy. Plushies, drink flavours, food flavours, movies, carpets, shoes. This guy has been oversaturated to the brim where he, no, most people don't even find him scary regardless now. They still love the monster, however, and when they see one, they always treat them with very good respect. There is still a lot of mysteries revolving this monster, however, like, what are its purple spikes for? Why is there a pink mist surrounding it? What do the blue things on its skin do? Well, I'm sure that's for another episode. But anyway, this is Thorngence, a mix between Thorn and Vengeance, the grass and dragon type. Anywho, now on to the last Fakemon we have on this episode. You know what else is popular in Japan? Softcore gambling. We all know gacha games and we all kind of hate them and we're all yet somehow still addicted to them. For those who don't know, gacha games, or just gachas in general, are those toy machines where you pop in a pound, you twist, and you get a capsule with a random toy in it. Now these are popular all around the world, but the reason I chose the specific Japan is, well just as a cute little uh, nod to the original Pokemon, what seemed to have a fair bit of inspired by, well, 
the gacha machines themselves, as the original Pokeball seemed to be uh, inspired by, well, the gacha ball, the little toy ball, which is, I thought was cute. Plus again, the whole Japanese liking cute little mascots, and the point of this mon is the point where, similar to gacha machines, in-game, you're meant to put, put some coins in, and you get given a ball with a random one of these gacha mons. And this gacha mon has several different forms, like unknown. However, unlike unknown, these all vary in type, and, well, have slightly different stats, can learn slightly different moves, and have slightly different attributes to them to make them more unique than just a different letter. And in game, there's machines all around the region where you can get, you know, certain machines have certain types of these little guys. On certain events, they'll spawn random machines to actually get the chance to get them. So some of them are limited, some of them are rare, some of them are common. It's a literal gacha monster. Now, altogether, there's going to be around, I want to say, like 20 to 30 types of these guys. However, for this first episode, I'm going to include three. Just because, well, I don't want to make 30 in one episode. And two, I think it's just going to be a fun little thing to work towards as well as more episodes I make. I'll add a few more of these types to the cast. Starting with the first three main types, fire, water and grass. Now, these are all meant to be kind of... They look a little bit plasticky, a little bit manufactured. They're like little toys what you just collect and they all have different types and personalities to them. They all look very similar but they all have different attributes like the fire one having fire hair, the water one having a little fish tail and the grass one having a little flower. Just simple things like that. I think they're simple but cute and I like them. What more can I say? I just like the idea that, like I said, on certain events, like if it's your birthday in game, you'll get the chance to uh, have a gacha go uh, well trying to buy a birthday one there'll be ones for certain holidays with certain special types things like that just something more than how they handle unknown where it's just you're in a cave and there's like a five percent chance to get any given one have fun filling a box of them what you'll never use because they all have the exact same type and moves these ones at least have a different reason to get them all other than just to say you have them all. They've all got different types and abilities and they're all cute and different. So anyway, these little guys are called Shushis. A mix between Shushu Hin, I think I'm pronouncing that right, which is Japanese for collectibles, and well, cuties, so Shushis. Plus it kind of sounds a little bit like sushi, but that's not I'm on purpose. It's just Shushis. They just sound like cute little collectibles. And that's what they are. They're like little fairies who just kind of float around on their own doing magic. Having said that, they're not actually fairy type. They're all only one types, at least these three specifically, just like water and grass. But either way, folks, that is the end of this episode. Wow, a lot of designs. This is why it took so long between episodes, not only just because of the internet and the fact that my throat is literally about to give out on me, but either way. Do you like them? Do you think some of them could use a bit more of a stronger Japanese essence, or do you think they're all alright? I do want to emphasise that, although these are based on Japan, None of them are 100% Japanese, and I like the idea that since the whole region is based around all the cultures coming together and none of them being separated, all of these designs aren't necessarily meant to be 100% Japanese, but they're all meant to be inspired by, well, the world as a whole, so who's to say that Kleeper might not have an American-inspired evolution, or maybe the monkeys will have an American counterpart, or who knows? It, it, what I'm saying is that they're not all just Japanese, it's all about the world as a whole, if that makes sense. I hope it does. Either way, let me know what designs you like, what designs you don't like, what designs you'd change, what designs you'd keep, what designs you'd want to have in your team, what teams you wouldn't want at all. I'm curious to see what you think. And let me know if you watched all the way through the whole half an hour episode. If you have, thank you. Let me know that you did. Let me know what you liked throughout the video and what you'd like to see in more ep videos. Because, well, now that a video's got over a thousand, I realised there's got to be something in that one video what people like, right? So if you see something in this video what you like and you want me to keep doing, let me know and I'll keep doing it. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day, or if you have to bear off the sweetest of dreams, I'm going to take a nap because I really do feel ill. And I'll see you all in a bit. Toodaloo. Bye.